Today's scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9, which can be found in the New Testament portion of your Bible. Before we hear the word, word of the Lord, let us pray. Dear Lord, take us, bend us, break us, mold us, fill us, fix us, shape us to further your kingdom and do your will. Amen. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Idea, and I urge Sancti, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. We have heard the word of the Lord. Today I want to talk to you about the hard work of a deep life. <clears throat> Part of our spiritual growth is closely tied to our own personal maturity and our ability to take ownership for our life, to be able to assess how we're doing, to notice what is good, to notice what is not, and then to set a path that would move us forward. That is personal maturity. That is spiritual growth. So as we talk about doing the hard work of a deep life, I want to just put this thought in your head that soul care is self-care. Okay? Soul care is self-care. One of the things that I appreciate about our faith is the understanding that scripture is written for our life. It is written to influence our mind and our heart. It is about the life you live, but it is also about the life of your mind. How we think about ourselves, how we think about others. It's never separated. It's never separated from how we live and how we behave. Never. When Jesus summarized his education and his understanding of scripture, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love neighbors as yourself. So you see that it's both for your head, and it's for your heart, it's for your hands. It's how you live your life. Barb and I met 20 years ago. 20 years, can you believe it? 20 years ago. And uh, we, we met in the San Francisco Bay Area, and for a time we lived in the middle of San Francisco. And a few times we played tourist when friends or family would come visit, and we rode those world famous trolley cars. How many of you have ever ridden a trolley car there? Okay. So if you've ever been to San Francisco, you know that it is a city of hills. And they said, we are going to put a grid pattern no matter what. No matter how steep the hill, no matter what. So those trolleys have to go uh, along the street and up the steep hills and then also down but the trolley cars do not have engines, right? So underneath the road, there is a system of cables. 
And so when the driver, which I call the cable guy, so when the ca or cable person uh, wants to move the trolley, they simply move the levers and something underneath the cable car grabs a hold of the cable that's running under the ground and that is what moves it along. A way to think about our faith is that when we pray, when we read, when we have communion, when we reflect upon our life, when we try to do better, when we learn, we are grabbing something deep within ourselves. And it is that faith, it is that sense of a spiritual communion with one another and with God that, and our yielding to it. You can't have the emergency break on. You, you yield to its power and that is what moves us forward in life. Does that make sense to you? So, so it's not about the surface stuff. Jesus, oftentimes, it really appears to me that sometimes he, he really had a problem with surface stuff. He was always talking about the heart, that that's what matters. And so if we want to grow in our personal maturity and our own sense of faith, then we need to be about the deeper things and not just the surface. So part of our spiritual growth is our ability to find ways and to discipline ourselves to get under and to latch on to that which would move us forward and to navigate relationships well and wisely, especially those relationships that are challenging. So let me go one step further and talk about taking inventory of yourself, assessing, noticing yourself. And believe it or not, this is passage points to the necessity and the genius of keeping Sabbath. And you said, I don't remember reading that. But the Sabbath is a day of ceasing, of reflecting. It's not about whether or not you work or do not work on one day of the week. It's actually about taking the opportunity, the privilege, I would say, to cease, to slow down your fevered pace, and to take the time to quiet yourself time that you check in with yourself. What's giving me joy these days? What can I rejoice in? What concerns are kind of rattling around inside of me? What's my energy level now? What am I worried about? Do I have goals? And am I closer or am I further away from the goals and achievements and aspirations I have for myself? Are the relationships to which I need to attend? That's the intention of the Sabbath. It's to slow down and to attend to your soul, whatever makes you, you. Taking the time to do this is difficult. And it's difficult no matter what season of life you're in. Okay, so you could be in the throes of raising kids and it's hard to do this. You could be in the middle of your career and it's hard to do this. You could be in the middle of caring for a family member. It's hard to do this. It can be very difficult to take the time to do this. Do you agree? I agree. You know why it's hard to do this? Because it's hard work. That's why it's hard. <laughs> That's why it's hard. But I really do think that you could do this once a month in about an hour and a half, maybe two. When we neglect our soul, we neglect ourself. And we let all of these things just kind of circle uh, the tower at the airport. Mm -hmm. Right? Then another worry takes off. And we never settle it. We never allow it to land, to come to an end, because we don't attend to it. So we just let all of these things kind of stir in our heart. And until we give it attention and say, hey, listen, you're going to really have to park it soon. I can't keep up with this. It's too much for me. You need to, you need to find a way to notice it, to name it, and then to draw some conclusions from it. So it's no wonder that soon we no longer know why we're anxious. We just know that we're anxious. 
or we have this nervous energy within us. All that we know is that we're tired, we're anxious, frustrated, sad. The issue is not just one thing, it's probably 12, it may be 20. But how will you know if you don't pay attention to it? And then our divisions within ourselves, because we feel torn in so many directions, our divisions within ourselves multiply, and then we no longer feel one. We no longer feel whole. We no longer feel whole with the Lord. So by regularly ceasing, we're quieting ourselves. We attend to our life. We're pulling the lever of truth. We're latching on to something deeper than ourselves, something bigger than ourselves. And that gives us the energy and the empowerment to move forward. We call that God. Let me get a little bit more practical. So you take some time. You take some time, hour and a half, two hours. I wouldn't do it at your kitchen table. I wouldn't do it at my kitchen table, I'll say that. Uh, we have an open floor plan, it would never get done. So, uh, but maybe you wanna go to a special place, a place for you. Maybe it's a park, somewhere in the city, somewhere outside, backyard, your favorite room, whatever it happens to be. And you take a pen and a paper and you just cease. You just cease, five minutes. Just be there, just be there. I like the prayer that Barbara just prayed. She would probably let you borrow that. She prays that prayer twice a day. Here I am. So you could say, here I am, God, and you are here with me. And you just pay attention. Don't write, just pay attention for five minutes. And then open up and just say, and just start to list the things, the big things in your life. So maybe you realize that you have job-related items that are taking up a lot of airspace in your life. They're family issues that you need, that need your attention. You have a friend that you're concerned about. And all told, after 10 minutes of doing this and just quietly, patiently writing it out, you have 12 issues. Wouldn't you like to have only 12 issues? Doesn't that just, that sounds wonderful. And then that's 12 issues besides the ordinary things that just kind of pop up out of nowhere. You got to clean the gutters. You got to pick up the sticks from the storm. You got to solve that deer problem, that groundhog problem. There's a presidential election. Did you know that there's an election coming up? Have you heard? Have you heard? And you look at your list and you ask these very simple questions. What do I need to take ownership of in this situation? What can I control? It's very few times is it the other person you can control, right? So how can you be a responsible party in this situation? So when you cease and you pay attention, you could say, I have been thinking of my friend for three weeks. This Wednesday, I'm going to call them and I'm gonna slot out 45 minutes to talk to my friend because I think that they need me in their life at this moment. Congratulations, you now only have 11 issues. <clears throat> and then you realize that that problem at work is actually not a forest fire that you realize that it felt like a forest fire because you had 11 other things in your life. And you were just in this heightened sense of anxiety and stress and you're just set on edge because you don't know what's going on in your heart. So oftentimes, instead of doing this, what we do is we go to the kitchen cabinet or the refrigerator or Netflix or Amazon or something like that. So congratulations, you paid attention, you reflected, you planned. You made a commitment, you lived it out, you're moving toward maturity. That's what spiritual growth is. Spiritual growth is your own personal growth as you connect with that deepest part of yourself. Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is within. It's within, it's the deep. So we're wanting to get deep to that part. So in the Sabbath, when we give our time to think and to reflect, we can come to this passage in Philippians chapter 4 and not think, and not think that Paul is saying, easy, easy, don't rock the boat, just focus on the positive. 
Because you could read that passage and say, well, these matters in my life really don't matter to God. And so I'm just to focus on all the positive stuff, whatever is good, true, commendable, so on and so forth. When actually, this passage is a call to action. Euodia, Syntyche, you're unified in the Lord. You have your personal differences with one another, but you need to do the deep work of understanding what it is you have in common. And the only way that you do that is you become gentle. The word, <laughs> the word gentle in Greek means reasonable. Literally, reasonable. Let your reasonableness be known to all. I'll leave out political commentary. But holy cow, if we could have a reasonable party, wouldn't that be great? So instead, this passage is calling us to action. It's not saying that you should forego your helpful human emotions, but it's learning to stand in the Lord. It's learning to stand in the Lord by taking ownership of what's inside of you. As one of my friends who's a counselor says, to learn how to take up your place in the world well. You stand in the Lord as someone who's beloved by God. Did you notice all of these loving things that Paul says here? Therefore, my brothers and sisters, so there's a spiritual kinship here, whom I love and I long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. You see that underneath this is the deep work of love where he's pleading for people. Be reasonable. Stop with your strict extremism and love one another. Feel the connection you have at a soul level with one another. Such a powerful passage. But as long as we're dealing with surface things, we don't get to the deep things that make us together. I have a friend I used to work with in Memphis, Tennessee. Her name's Courtney. She's on a podcast uh, recently. She's an ultra marathon runner. I don't know why, but she is. So she's run several 50 plus mile events and she's done a few 100 mile races also. And the host asked her, so what did you learn? She said, after I ran my first 50, I realized I can do hard things. I can do hard things. Friends, you can do hard things, but they're hard. And this is why you need a community of support. Let me finish this. Think of an iceberg. You know this. What's visible? 10%? About 90% is under the water? Yes? What Sunday morning does, this sliver of time, and what you can do on your own is just with the Lord is to go down a little bit further under the surface. And all of those things that are stirring in your heart that make you uneasy, sad, anxious, disappointed, frustrated, isn't it better if you were able to see that? and to understand how that was impacting your life and the life of your loved ones, that's what we're doing. You're helping yourself and those that you love. So ironically, by ceasing, you actually give yourself time to do hard work. It's not giving up work on the Sabbath, it's giving space in your life to take care of the work. So, when we cease and we take time and we reflect, we meet the Lord in the watchtower of our hearts, so to speak. And instead of fruitlessly worrying, we can enter this kind of work knowing that the Lord is going to help us move forward as we're connected at our soul level with God. This is actually how we end up becoming followers of Jesus that love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we're able to love other people better. So instead of flying off the handle and just our internal RPMs always being in the orange, we just snap at people. We can take time, 
put it in neutral, perhaps park, quiet our soul, and become more reasonable. That actually could be one of the most outstanding witnesses that the Christian church could give to this tumultuous time that we're in. Kindness, gentleness, thoughtfulness. I would love to live in that kind of world. So friends, I pray that, you would, that this would have a home in your heart and that you would consider what it would look like for you once a month perhaps to take an hour and a half to two hours and just sit and be and then to allow the Lord to enter the chaos, the storm of your life, and then to bring peace to you. I want that for me. <laughs> I want that for you. I want that for our community. And we can do this together. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless the preaching and the reading of the word.